I mean, it just, you know, total destruction. I mean, people, the whole, everybody was cash strapped. Even the KGB was out of money. And so what did they do? Along came the Yakuza and they made a really good arrangement. They said, hey, we'll give you $900 million down and for a billion dollars a year, can we lease some of your scalar weapon sites? And they said, hey, sure, what a deal, you know. So in 1989, the Yakuza began training their technicians. And since 1990, this rogue group has been attacking the U.S. by controlling our weather, of course, to our detriment. Now, in 2004, they really stepped up operations big time. And a lot of you may remember, we had very, very strange weather. We had like a whole barrage of hurricanes hit Florida, those those hurricanes did weird things. Ivan did a 180 degree turn. The Hurricane G did a, Gene did a 360 degree loop before reaching Florida. And again, this shows the kind of control available through these scalar devices. Now, the next slide has nothing to do with scalar warfare, but I just thought it was very appropriate at this time. Hurricane Charlie hit Orlando, and the winds were so high they actually peeled off a billboard. Underneath was an older billboard that said, We need to talk. God. And I call that a sign from the Almighty. You know, like, I'm getting your attention. Hello? Now, Hurricane Katarina, same year, but this is very, very unusual because this is the first ever recorded hurricane in the South Atlantic. That's supposed to be impossible. It came ashore in Brazil on March 28 with 90 mile an hour winds and did substantial damage. And a lot of people believe this was a deliberate, deliberate probe by the Yakuza to produce and drive ashore a hurricane where the textbooks say one is impossible. And again, to see if Western scientists and government groups were able to identify that that's what they were doing. And again, there's no evidence that such was the case. Under the watchful eye of the KGB, the Yakuza has carried scalar technology back to Japan and in clandestine facilities, they've been building portable scalar weapons, EMP weapons, possible negative energy weapons. So, for example, um, in, in some of these visions that Stan was discussing before, you can now very easily get a, a scalar weapon onto an airplane or onto a jet and have it fly in and just anything that came at it would just drop down like dead flies all around it. Uh, EMP weapons, possibly negative energy EMP weapons. So, you know, they could fit one of these in the back of an SUV or in a good-sized aircraft. The plan that the, this Yakuza group has is to attack the U.S. power grid within the next couple of years. So watch out, because, see, our power grid is extremely vulnerable. Um, we have, we've already learned up on the East Coast, of course, a couple years ago, they had that really bad blackout that lasted, I think, at least a day or so. And who knows, maybe that was even caused by scalar technology. We don't know. Uh, you see there Hoover Dam on the screen. And that is the nexus for the power grid for the whole southwestern United States. And, and because our power grid is so centralized and so fragile, it's real easy to take out. Beyond that, the Yakuza has used its economic muscle to, to make a concerted effort to keep all free energy products off the market. That EFTV there means energy from the vacuum. That's what Tesla was working on. That's what many scientists today are working on, free, excuse me, free energy from the vacuum. However, you know, the Yakuza won't let it happen. There were two separate Japanese engines that were developed. One was the Takahashi magnetic Wankel engine. The other one is the Kawai engine. Both of those projects were basically quashed by the power of the Yakuza. Uh, secondarily, the U.S. Department of Energy and the energy industry in this company, in this country, has shows little interest in moving beyond its hundred-year-old paradigm. Think about this for a moment, folks. The U.S. power grid in this country is still running the way Edison wanted it to run a hundred years ago. The only difference is, is that they've added a few computers along the way. But this real attenuated, fragile power structure is still in place. They've really made no change in the last century. Now, if they could use instead these energy from the vacuum replacement systems, different things would happen. They would need no central fuel sources. They'd need no tankers. they need no pipelines. 
They need no oil refineries. Secondly, the massive and expensive support structure for our bloated power system would be virtually done away with. Our present dependence on foreign oil and gas would virtually disappear. Uh, a very drastic reduction in pollution to the environment would result. And also a dramatic reduction of the present absolute vulnerability of the U.S. power system uh, would happen. The resulting benefits of a fuel-free system like this would be immediately evident to both the long-suffering U.S. taxpayers and also to many people overseas that, that cannot afford to have any kind of power. And uh, the results would be incalculable. However, what would happen to the energy cartels and the energy bureaucracies, the damage it would do to them would be indeed very calculable indeed. And that's the problem. So such powerful organizations do not surrender their control readily. And the, the sad thing is, is that no, there's no incentive in our country for people to produce these kind of, of energy systems. And not only is our scientific community fiddling while Rome prepares to burn, but it's helping to ensure that Rome burns completely. And of course here Rome would be in the United States. Now, it's, impo it's impossible to understand the level of danger here. Uh, even from like hackers and cyber war techniques, our energy grid could fall apart overnight. This is what I'm going to read from you is an interview that was done on Frontline PBS some time ago with a guy named Joe Weiss who is an energy consultant. And they asked him this. They said, put it in perspective. What's the worst case scenario uh, in terms of loss of power? He says, absolute worst, I won't even say absolute, but a very worst case would be the loss of power for six months or more. And they asked, over how big an area? And he said, as big as you want. And they said, is that a possibility? Yes. So imagine being without electrical power for six months. You know, I mean, it would be devastating to every aspect of our life in this country, and yet they're doing nothing about it. Now, the third... Uh, no, there we go. The, uh, the third threat, of course, is from Islamic terrorists. And bin Laden and other terrorist factions have been desperately trying to acquire energetics weapons, but as far as we know, they have not yet done so. And of course, the problem with these guys is, number one, they're perfectly willing to take out civilians as money as they need, and secondarily, they don't care if they die themselves, because of course, they, they're going go to uh, go to paradise and have 72 virgins and all of that stuff. So they don't care if they die, and that makes them a very dangerous enemy. And of course, they want to use these kind of weapons to bring down the United States and Israel, and they would be an appalling way to achieve that goal. Then we have U.S. societal engineering. There's a branch of this part of the mind snapper mode that's called psychoenergetics. And what they do with this is they create increasing amounts of fracture lines down U.S. society. You can see them all up there, gay versus straight, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, different religious groups are set against each other, or even like liberal Christians versus conservative Christians. Many experts tell us that the U.S. is now more fractured sociologically than it's ever been since the Civil War. I mean, think about that. And they, they can actually use these psychoenergetic systems to increase the level of stress that people feel, the level of anxiety, the level of tension that they feel. And they can cause civil unrest and even rioting. But they can do even more than that. Uh, there have been dramatic tests done of distant total control of a person's mind when that person was doing something extremely complicated. Examples are most obvious. The, the s tragic story of Captain Buttons and Captain Svoboda back in 1997. These were two military pilots who apparently cheerfully flew their jets in the sides of mountains and destroyed themselves. And there's no evidence that there was anything wrong with the airplane. They, 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 they made no maydays. They, they just all of a sudden went off course for no reason and flew their jets into a mountain. Now, even more bizarre is the case of Captain Hess in 1998. Uh, here was a guy who was out jogging, again, a highly trained military officer, all of a sudden, he sat down, pulled out a knife, and stabbed himself 26 times in the chest and neck. Naturally, he died. But here's the interesting thing. Forensic scientists will tell you that if indeed 
you are able to do